Good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is the CNC3 7 p.m. news. I'm Kamal Georges. And I'm Maria Rambley. Here's what's making our headlines. Less than a week after schools reopen, education officials and labs record a spike in COVID cases among little ones. Local Aeropost customers among thousands affected by data breach at the U.S.-based company. Rich Plain residents want justice for PC Jilts, but say they'll only support an independent investigation. Good evening, I'm Ryan Bechu. Here's what's coming up in sport. TNT's under-17 footballers suffer another heavy defeat, this time against Nicaragua in their second CONCACAF under-17 match. It was a day of showers and thunderstorms across Trinidad and Tobago, but the rainfall isn't done with us just yet. Join me, Clay Hussein, for the details in tonight's forecast. We begin with some news just coming to hand. Two decomposing bodies have been found in a house in Maracas. CNC3 News understands the bodies, believed to be two males, are burnt beyond recognition. Details are still coming in, but we understand the bodies were found in a wooden house located a short distance away from the pillars along the North Coast Road. Police suspect the bodies could be the residents of the house. We've been told a young girl also resided at the location. However, she cannot be found at this time. A search is ongoing to locate the girl and officers are searching a nearby precipice. We will bring you more on this story as it develops. Now, it's been one week since schools fully reopened and already there are at least 28 children testing positive for COVID-19, while 92 more are in quarantine. However, the Education Minister assures the Education District Health Unit is helping principals to manage the cases. Rashad Khan has more in this report. Since the third school term began last week, 28 students from 16 schools have tested positive for COVID-19, while the results of 18 students are still pending. Now, 92 students are currently in quarantine. The Education Minister, Dr. Nyan Gadsby Dolly, says the district health units are assisting principals in managing these cases. However, CNC3 News was unable to get an official list from the Ministry of Schools that were affected. However, this is an unconfirmed list of schools we were able to create based on reports coming to us from parents. Of these reports, the majority are primary schools. UE Faculty of Sciences Dean and Pulmonologist Professor Terence e. Mungal tells CNC3 News there is no clear way to tell whether the students contracted the disease in the schools or outside over the Easter weekend. However, he says it's not surprising there are so many cases among the children given the spread of the Omicron variant in the population. We would expect that when schools will govern, not their schools, but the population, and of course, as you said, the Easter weekend was a, was, was a little while ago, that you will expect a rise in cases. The Education Ministry has dismissed rumors that talks were underway to close schools in light of the cases. And even though cases are on the rise, Simangal believes the best course of action is to stay the course, as there is no need yet to talk about reintroducing restrictions. You see, with the relaxation of, of restrictions, you will expect an increase in cases, but you have to balance that against the severity of the cases. Mm -hmm. So far, it does not appear to be severe. Rashad Khan, CNC3 News. Parents of standard three students attending the Brighton Anglican Primary School in La Brea are complaining about unsanitary conditions in their classroom. The parents say the classroom has an awful scent that could affect the children's health. This morning, they removed their children from school to highlight their displeasure with the situation, as well as a lack of furniture. For the few parents that brought out their children, we are now taking the children back home. One, because the area is not suitable, it is not equipped, there's no benches or desks, chairs, anything. And two, the scent is not feasible for housing children in that area. A lot of children will end up with respiratory diseases or respiratory illness on top of a pandemic, on top of wearing masses. Trim explains that when parents got to the school on Monday, they were told to take their children home and return on Tuesday. This was because the classroom still needed to air out as it was recently painted. But the mother says she will not be sending her child back to school until the issues are sorted. She has two suggestions for the authorities regarding the standard three students. To continue doing homeschooling until... Until... Until the relevant authorities do something to address the situation where the location of the class is or to move the children to a suitable areas, how, how, like Sobo Community Center. 
Now, when TNC3 uh, contacted the education minister, Dr. Nian gatsby Doll, she said the direct information from the school is that the classroom was recently painted, is being aired out, and was scheduled to house the students tomorrow. She added that is still the plan and no furniture issues have been reported. Now, torrential rainfall flooded parts of the east-west corridor this afternoon. But this weather wasn't entirely unexpected. That's right, Kamal, with multiple areas inundated. We have Colleen standing by to tell us where experienced flooding and what exactly caused these heavy rains. Ria and Kamal, it really felt like a wet season day because after a mostly hot and sunny morning around midday, the skies erupted with thunderstorms near central Trinidad and those storms intensified as they moved north. Now, violent rainfall rates caused floods as far east as Tunapuna, St. Augustine, Mount Hope, El Socorro, Movan, and Barataria seen here where thunderstorms finally reached Port of Spain. They really packed a punch. We were all hearing the loud thunders in our offices and I'm sure many of you were too. But the heavy rains flooded many of the the usual spots in Lower Port of Spain like Edward Street seen here and along various areas of Arapita Avenue and Tragreet Road with flooding extending north and northwest of Port of Spain, Maraval, St. Anne's and Santa Cruz as well as Diego Martin. Now two rivers were of concern today, the first the Malik River at Maritime Plaza Morvant which burst its banks, flooding parts of the Priority Bus Route and the Link Road to the highway as well as the Diego Martin River which thankfully remained within its banks. We also saw flooding in parts of central Trinidad later this afternoon as more thunderstorms erupted. But what caused all of this activity? Well, near Trinidad and Tobago, we have lots of moisture and instability from a number of weather systems that all came together. You can see all of the lightning across northwestern Trinidad, combined with our local daytime heating, sea breezes, and our mountains squeezing out the moisture. Well, the rains aren't done with us just yet, and I'll have those details later in the newscast. Back to you. Thank you so much, Colleen. Meanwhile, the electricity supply to the Barataria South Secondary School had to be turned off following the inclement weather. The bad weather caused overhead wires to spark and fueled the fears that an electrical fire was possible. But the education minister is denying reports that students and teachers were trapped inside and unable to leave the school's premises. Minister Dr. Nian Gatsby Dolly is confirming overhead wires sparked but said the lines did not fall. TNTech has since reconnected the supply to the school. Yeah, that weather was really something today. Pretty unexpected, at least for me. It, it Absolutely, Kamala. I understand several government ministries located in the Port of Spain area also allowed workers to leave early, early. today. Yeah, yeah. And, and in addition to that, I was told by one of our producers that it caused uh, a bit of a, a situation at Piaco as well. Many planes could not land because of the intensity of that weather uh, okay. this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Still ahead in the news this evening here on CNC3. With Carl on the route to recovery, the company may consider rehiring some of its retrenched workers. A St. Madeleine man, unable to walk for almost two decades, finally finds treatment locally but can't afford it. And coming up later on in sport, Jenna Ross and Jean-Marc Grandison top the national aquathlon. Stick around for highlights later in sport. Local customers of U.S.-based logistics company Airpost have been forced to cancel their credit cards amid a widespread data breach. The recent incident has left online shoppers concerned despite assurances that the issue has been resolved. Now, resident shipping companies are advising customers not to be alarmed but rather be vigilant. Jesse Ramdale tells us more in this report. A high-profile data breach has left customers here at home and across the region counting their losses. On Sunday, customers of U.S.-based shipping company Aeropost were advised that their credit cards may have been compromised as a safety system that stores encrypted information was hacked. Just as how we are getting better at technology and we're learning more, I mean, the, the cyber criminals out there, they're getting smarter and they're learning ways and how to actually breach systems and get into systems. On Sunday, the Miami-based company alerted customers that the hackers may attempt to use their credit cards. It advised them to check their statements and request a new credit card. It is not yet known how many local customers have been affected. However, social media was abuzz with concerned users of Aeropost. Customers acknowledged that their credit cards had been breached. Some told CNC3 News that they weren't too rattled as they were alerted to the fake transactions and were able to stop them in time. However, we understand not all were so lucky. 
Gerard Reek, Innovations and Solutions Manager at Rams Logistics, a supply chain management company, said these attacks are not new. It's why he's urging customers to be alert. Any personal information you have to enter, you always make sure that you know you be very careful about it and only enter it in reputable sources and reputable websites. However, Managing Director of WebSource, Lincoln Mirage, said despite all the preventative measures, there can be no guarantee that customers will not be infiltrated. It all boils down to which company hackers decide to go after and whose data they, they, they want to, to ask a ransom for. So it really, it, we don't know. Right now, a hacker could be trying to hack my own identity and try to be me in another country. Aeropost continues to remind customers to delete their credit card information and report fraudulent transactions. Jesse Ramde, CNC3 News. Over $6 million in marijuana has been destroyed by police. Officers of the stolen vehicle squad in the Eastern Division were conducting an anti-crime exercise on Saturday when they came upon a marijuana plantation. While searching a bushy area of La Saiva Road, Sangre Grande, they found 5,000 fully grown marijuana trees, 200 seedlings, and 10 pounds of cured weed. The, dr the drugs were estimated to have a street value of $6.3 million. Residents of Rich Plain Road in Dago Martin are calling for a swift, independent investigation into what happened on Friday that resulted in the death of PC Clarence Jilks. According to one resident, the family at least deserves closure and the truth to be told. Several residents are claiming that when police officers were shooting at a suspect last Friday, one of their own bullets killed PC Jilks. However, officers say it was the suspect who shot their colleague. The residents are now willing to cooperate with the police complaints authority in an independent investigation. Meanwhile, the search for the ma main suspect is ongoing as he's yet to surrender, despite reportedly promising to do so over the weekend. A United National Congress senator is tonight saying that the party is being very careful with how it releases its evidence into allegations of government spying. Both the Prime Minister and National Security have now called on Kamala Prasad Bissessa to provide tangible proof to validate her accusation. Mrs. Prasad Bissessa has been claiming that the government is spying on private citizens and those in the state sector. However, speaking on CNC3's The Morning Brew, Senator Jayanti Lachimedia said the opposition leader cannot be callous nor carefree with the sensitive information in her possession. You don't want to expose the identities of not just the, the person who has given you the information, but you would also have to talk, think about other um, things that might be named in those documents. So it's not just a matter of release the information, it's a matter of being responsible with the information. In the meantime, Senator Lachmedia said the public needs to decide if the alleged legal surveillance qualifies as a threat to national security. She said there are thousands of interceptions done by the SSA and some of those reports were laid in Parliament. One political analyst believes now that Ansel Dennis is the Tobago leader of the PNM, he will not be surprised if he tries to enter the Tobago House of Assembly as a minority councillor. Currently, that position is held by Petal Daniel Benoit. Dr. Shane Mohammed says for the party to rebuild, it must do so from the sole seat it holds in those chambers, thanks to Calvin Morris. Dr. Mohammed says Ansel Dennis is a seasoned politician in Tobago and the party may need his expertise in the House. He has more experience than Kelvin Morris. So I think what he may be charged with the responsibility of doing is supporting Kelvin Morris from the back, uh, from the background and giving him advice and, and, and kind of mentoring and coaching him um, as the minority leader, whilst at the same time uh, going and hitting the ground running. Dr. Mohammed says Dennis will have to work very hard with Tobagonians to win their trust, as currently the Chief Secretary Farley Augustine is a favorite on the island. To some business news now, the announcement that several events for Point Fort and Bardi will be canceled has left several stakeholders reeling financially. Stakeholders say the sudden reversal just a week ahead of events will cost them thousands. Peter Christopher reports.
The cancellation of several major Point Fortin Baroday events has left many stakeholders scrambling. One representative at Juve Scene Investigators estimates the band has lost thousands of dollars due to the sudden cancellation, as social media ads and material for costumes had already been purchased. The band is also in the process of organizing refunds for customers. Baroday is an event which brings a high number of visitors and is a key semblance of business activity in the Southwest Borough. It has not been held since 2019. Point Fortin Mayor Salima Thomas, in a post to social media on Monday, says the Point Fortin Borough Council took careful note of the uptick in COVID-19 cases and the reopening of schools this week and factored the risks to society as a whole. As a result, the Mayor confirms the cancellation of all community spotlights, the military parade, traditional mass, pan extravaganza and juve. Mayor Thomas says the Council will release a revised calendar of events and will also be meeting with major stakeholders. Trinidad Cement Limited has recorded a significant improvement in revenue for financial year 2021. In the company's annual report for the year ended December 31st, 2021, TCL Group Chairman David G. Inglefield says the group continued to respond effectively to challenges arising from the COVID-19 pandemic and a highly volatile economic environment. He says despite these hurdles, the year ended with an improved result of $190 million in net income a significant increase in comparison to 15 million in 2020. He says these positive results were generated from an annual revenue of 1.9 billion, a 12% increase over 2020, primarily due to strong pent-up demand for cement in the group's primary markets, as well as a continuation of strict cost control, which mitigated the significant inflation experience, especially during the second half of the year. RBC Financial Limited has made donations to eight Caribbean conservation charities, including the Trinidad and Tobago Grand Riviere Nature Association, in recognition of Earth Day 2022. In addition to the donations totaling US $4,000, RBC also shared that it will be introducing green energy financing to support businesses interested in purchasing and installing renewable energy systems. Peter Christopher, CNC3 Business Watch. With several new routes now in operation, Caribbean Airlines says it will have to decide if any of the employees who were retrenched last year will be rehired. Corporate Communications Manager Dion de Gaulle says Cal retrenched 280 people last year, although it originally intended to send home 400 and 50. At that time, the airline suffered a $172 million loss. But earlier today, Lagos said 2022 is a year of recovery for Cal, and the airline is renewing its fleet and enhancing its service. Still to come in the news, search operations continue on the MV Fairchance with hope of finding the captain. Good Monday evening, everyone. Across Trinidad and Tobago today, even with all the clouds and rainfall, temperatures did get up to 31.9 degrees at Piaco, which is relatively warm, and with all the humidity, it definitely felt warmer than that. Minimum lows this morning was a warm 24.6 degrees, and similar temperatures are forecast tomorrow. We have some more showers and even some isolated thunderstorms on our way. I'll have those details later in the newscast. Welcome back. Criminologist Dr. Wendell Wallace believes the solution to crime is in the classroom. Dr. Wallace says there is an endless cycle of short-term fixes in this country that do not address the root causes. Dr. Wallace tells CNC3's The Morning Brew that there is little the police can do in the face of an increasingly violent society. He says it's now time to listen to children on why they are resorting to violence in schools and to teach them in their formative years that aggression is not the solution. How do we get parents involved? Do, are we saying that, that it's a police problem only? No, it's not a police problem only. It's a familial problem. It's a school problem. It's a communal problem. It's a UNI problem and we need 
all these persons on board, not only the police with newer techniques, but we need the schools with newer techniques as well. We need parents with newer techniques as well. Dr. Wallace says the recent spate of murders has to do with the fact that people have full reign to interact after the easing of COVID restrictions. But he says any reaction from the police will be another short-term measure. With the allegations of sexual misconduct at schools resurfacing, there's now a call for the state to appoint a children's ombudsman. Activist Marcus Kisun says the recent stories told in the media about sexual assault at educational institutions shine a huge spotlight on the failure of the state's mechanisms to treat with these reports. Kisun questions why, in most cases, it takes years for the perpetrator to be brought to justice. He also asks why the onus is on the survivor of abuse to make a statement before the police can investigate. Kisun says there is no accountability structures when it comes to dealing with children, and it's time that an office is created where they can properly manage the state's resources. A children's ombudsperson will help now in kind of managing, um, um, coordinating, and taking up a, another responsibility to ensure that those who are who are who are, who are in the duty of protecting children live up to both their professional and moral and ethical duties. Kisun says the necessary laws are there, but it may be time to call on a watchdog to ensure they are enforced effectively. It's now time for the weather, and if you missed all of Colleen's warnings last week that rain was coming, there was another telltale sign, Kamal, some extreme heat experience yeah. just before all that rainfall today. Yeah, this morning in particular was, like you said, sweltering, and then that weather changed almost in an instant. That's right, let's yeah. go to Colleen now to explain why was Rian, it so hot today. Ria and Kamal, it really felt steamy. That's probably the best way to put it ahead of those showers and thunderstorms that moved across Port of Spain today. Now, the maximum high temperature at Piaco was 31.9. It In Port of Spain, it was around 32 degrees, but with all the moisture in the atmosphere that fueled these showers and thunderstorms, I'm just going to step away to see this magnificent photo taken from West Moorings as those thunderstorms moved across Port of Spain earlier today. Well, that fuel or moisture is what made things feel warmer than usual and it also fueled the showers and thunderstorms to cause heavier than usual rain and we're going to be seeing more of that over the next several days because we have multiple weather systems in place that will be coming together to produce some heavy rainfall so we have a non-tropical low pressure system in the far north atlantic that has weakened the pressure gradient across the lesser antilles so that's why our winds are fairly light to near calm we also had a trough system that has now weakened and moved across the lesser antilles and on top of that, we have a, what's called a shear line that is extending from this low-level system or low-pressure system across the Lesser Antilles. All of these things coming together means lots of moisture, lots of instability, and that means for us lots more rain and even more thunderstorms. So looking at the forecast for us overnight tonight, variably cloudy skies. We will be seeing those showers return overnight tonight into uh, the early morning, especially across southern parts of Trinidad. That's where we can see some more thunderstorm activity overnight. Minimum low temperatures around 23 to 24 degrees across both islands. And for tomorrow, a variably cloudy day with showers and isolated thunderstorms from the late morning through the afternoon across both islands, but we will see locally heavier activity across western and northern parts of Trinidad. And that's where we're watching out for gusty winds and street and flash flooding. Now for mariners, we don't have any marine advisories in effect, but during heavier showers and thunderstorms, definitely exercise caution, especially with that lightning. In open waters, waves right now are slight to moderate, waves up to 1.5 meters. In sheltered areas, near calm, but could become choppy during those heavier showers and thunderstorms. And looking at our forecast for the remainder of this week, really rain through Thursday. We could see a stray thunderstorm on Friday when that trough system moves through all the way in the East Atlantic, but generally a wet week for Trinidad and Tobago, and we'll finally see sunnier conditions by Saturday, but we'll also be seeing a surge of Saharan dust. So enjoy the rain while we can, because the dust is on the horizon. Back to you. Great. Enjoy the rain, he said. <laughs> That's only what's still to come in the news. With the country reopening, the health minister urges continued vaccination. He says it's the only way out of the pandemic.
Welcome back, everyone. For more than a decade, a St. Madeline man has been living with a muscle degenerating condition. Now confined to a wheelchair, he has never given up hope of one day finding treatment. He only recently discovered someone willing to treat him right here in this country. But as our team of Sasha Wilson and Christian De Silva tell us, tells us, he desperately needs help to source the funds. Well, as is, as is daytime, well, basically this will be the day. Sitting up on a bed is something many of us take for granted, but for 47-year-old Errol Goddard, it's a painstaking process. If you can imagine for a moment, your, your physical hand, you can raise your own physical hand over your head, right? Father Satan, stand up. 17 years ago, Goddard was diagnosed with limb girdle muscular dystrophy and went from a robust man and successful welder to using a wheelchair and barely able to move his body. My um, condition is from my neck straight on to my ankle and basically it's a wasting degenerative condition which basically over time it causes you to lose all ability to stand up Pull yourself up. They do basically the thing that you will normally do with your muscle when it is progressing the right way. So, a resident of St. Madeline, Goddard lives alone, but his brother and sister would prepare his meals and help with household chores. Being able to, to raise up a bit, roll around in a wheelchair, that's basically as much as I can do. You know, and with a fighting mind, you know, I still try to do a little, little thing like, like make, to be honest, make my breakfast in the morning. You know, the easiest thing, put a small um, a hot plate and make some oatmeal in the morning, well, that's about it. Despite being told that there is no cure, Goddard tells CNC3 News, he refused to give up. Now he has found hope through a stem cell treatment which is being done locally by a private doctor. What the treatment basically does is take your stem cells from within your body and re, re inject it. Well, they synthesize it and make sure they get the right ones that progresses instead of regresses and they re inject it back into the muscles that is affected, like your neck, your shoulder, your legs, and wherever else. But despite fundraising efforts over the last two years, he has only raised roughly $20,000. It's just a fraction of the $100,000 he needs. I'm a young guy, I have two sons, you know. I like to be more of an input, an impact with them, you know, for, for them, you know, especially on, on just about everything. Boys need their dad, especially. Anyone willing to assist can contact 346-4893 or 753-2246. Donations can also be made online through his FundMe TNT account or his RBC account. Sasha Wilson, CNC3 News. So hard to watch that, Kamal. Let's hope he gets yeah, the help I that he needs. Yeah, I certainly hope that he gets the help that he needs. Uh, there is still a glimmer of hope tonight that captain of the MV Fairchance, Dexter Chance, is still alive. He is the only crew member still missing from the vessel which overturned on April 2nd. Today, reporter Otto Carrington and cameraman Josiah Paul were able to board the MV Fairchance to get an exclusive look at the vessel and the continued search. We have more in this report. It's been just about a month since the MV Fair Chance overturned off Monos Island. This dreaded journey to St. Vincent took the lives of four persons and one crew member, the captain, Dexter Chance, still missing. The operations turned from rescue to recovery with four bodies salvaged from the vessel two weeks ago. The vessel is now floating off the coast of Chagaramas. One of the survivors, Jonel McIntosh, returned to Trinidad and Tobago after leaving to continue the search for his captain. He shares his displeasure with the authorities. They didn't even have a search on the vessel. They didn't have a search to say in case the captain would have been back on the vessel by mistake. And it's hard me to see the vessel is here. We get everybody and the main person of the vessel is missing, which is the captain. And the guys, 
Imagine we have a look outside when the boat was rolled over the coast guard said they were guarding. And up to now we cannot find the captain. If you were guarding this vessel, how the captain could have get out the vessel without nobody seeing his float or come on. The bodies of Eric Calise, Owen Prescott, and Devon Celesting were recovered last week. But McIntosh says the authorities did not search the vessel, and they are now faced with this task. There is places I cannot access on the vessel still, so we're trying to make a little search just to see if, we can, if the captain is there. We still are searching for the captain. If you look, there is things that we're just trying to go through, eventually put them on the deck just to see, make clearance. Well, look at the kitchen there still. Yeah, we're looking at the, um, the kitchen room. We're looking to go in inside there and see if we can see the captain anyway, because the Coast Guard did not search. They came, and what they did, they go and who they see, they just took them off. He gives a tour to show the areas of the vessel still blocked. The access to the kitchen is still blocked. You can have a look. Look at the access to the kitchen. It's still blocked. To the galley, it's still blocked in. The Coast Guard didn't even come in there. We don't even know as yet if the captain is here. The bodies of the three men are expected to be cremated and returned to St. Vincent and the Grenada. Mark Inter says returning to the vessel is heartbreaking as he replaced a tragic moment. He says he had to return to ensure everyone's body was found. I came back because the boat flew to identify those bodies. Yeah, because there wasn't no one around to identify those bodies. Yeah, so you got some family here, but they wouldn't know the next guy because some of the guys with locks were missing. So they look different. And you know, I could identify because he's my crew member from the last color of uniform they had on and the clothes. So I could identify those bodies. The crew and others are expected to continue clearing the vessel, hoping to find the last crew member. Autopsy results have revealed that grandmother Sita Jagasa, who was discovered dead at her Debe home last Tuesday, was beaten and strangled. The autopsy found that Jagasa died from multiple blunt force injuries and manual strangulation. Now, police say a close female relative is assisting them with their investigations. 62-year-old Jagasa was killed on April 19th at her Clarkier Drive Wellington Road home. A 13-year-old granddaughter returned home and found her body on the floor with wounds to her face and head. Now that the country is back, is opening back up, the health minister says it is important for people to still get vaccinated against COVID-19. Minister Terence Dial Singh was speaking at a health fair in Trinity Mall to commemorate vaccination week in the Americas. While he admitted that relaxed health regulations may give people a sense of normality, he says the only way to eradicate diseases is through continued vaccination. So the message is vaccines are safe, vaccines are effective. Vaccinate your children against childhood diseases because school has reopened. You need your child to be vaccinated to get back into school. If you are not vaccinated for COVID, get vaccinated. And if you are vaccinated for COVID, get boosted. With just about 51% of the population vaccinated against COVID-19, CAFA says Trinidad and Tobago has the third or fourth highest rate in the region. Every year, the last week in April is celebrated as Vaccination Week in the Americas. Let's recap the day's main headlines as we leave you. Less than a week after schools reopen, education officials and labs record a spike in COVID cases among little ones. Local Aeropost customers among thousands affected by a data breach at the U.S.-based company. That's all that we have time for this evening. Thank you so very much for your time and your company. I'm Kamal Georges. And I'm Ria Rambley. Have a good night.